I had no idea the British press was so bigoted. This one's wife, Duchess Sophie Slays, this one's wife. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Narcissists regularly engage in triangulation. Triangulation can be done either benign, malign, and in some instances, both. How might that work? Well, for instance, the narcissist might say to you, that's an excellent piece of work that you've done. Your last one was good. This one is even better. Thus, you have been triangulated with your previous work, which was still complemented, but your current output has been described as excellent, magnificent, and therefore you have been praised and triangulated with your existing work in a flattering way so as to control you, to cause you to respond with, oh, thank you, I'm pleased that you are happy with what I've been creating. Thus, you provide fuel to the narcissist. You can be triangulated in a malign way. Why can't you be more like your brother? He behaves himself, but you, you're an absolute waste of space. I regret the day I ever gave birth to you. A parental narcissist belittling the child, who may be an adult child or still a minor, and does so by triangulating them with another sibling, criticising them by comparing them against that sibling for the purposes of asserting control over that sibling. But it can also be done whereby the narcissist triangulates both in a good and bad way at the same time. For instance, this is commonly the case where the narcissist has drawn you in as the new intimate partner primary source and during the golden period. And it's quite common for the narcissist to men make mention of an ex. Oh, you know something? You're not like her. You're far sweeter, far kinder, far more beautiful. She was unstable, you know. Absolute fruitcake. Absolute Cocoa Pops crazy. I'm so delighted I'm with you. Two triangulations are taking place. You, as the intimate partner primary source in the golden period, are being compared favourably with the nutjob X. Thus, you're flattered, you're being controlled, you'll presumably respond in a favourable way, which shows that you're under control and you'll provide fuel. It also, with you saying, oh, you don't have to worry about the X, you're with me now, everything's going to be okay, enables that narcissist to have an indirect sense of control over the X. Thus, the narcissist triangulates you with the X in a benign way, controlling you directly, and compares the X unfavourably with you. Therefore, the X is gained control over indirectly. You can be triangulated with people, events and objects. And given that I'm the ultra, I'm going to triangulate this one's wife with Sophie, Duchess of Edinburgh, to demonstrate a comparison between the two so that you can see how the non-narcissist behaves as compared to the way that the narcissist does. Kate Mansey, writing in the Times, explains, Pulling a funny face for a baby, checking the weight of a Shetland pony and cuddling a rescue chicken affectionately known as Stumpy were all part of a day's work for the Duchess of Edinburgh. Sophie, 59, was taking part in an away day in Surrey, visiting Hale Community Centre in Farnham, Maine, M-A-N-E, Chance Animal Sanctuary, and Parity for Disab Disability, which supports people with multiple disabilities. While the visit may be precisely what one might expect from a working member of the royal family, Sophie's role has become increasingly important to an institution suffering from a staffing problem. As the king continues his cancer treatment and the Princess of Wales recovers from chemotherapy, the Duchess is increasingly being called upon to represent the royal family home and abroad. An analysis of the court circular, the official record of royal engagements, shows that the Duchess's workload has more than doubled this month compared with the same period last year. So far, in September, Sophie has carried out 37 engagements, compared with 18 for the same dates last year. Last year, she was listed as the fourth hardest working member of the royal family, with 114 official engagements. 
Her husband Edward, the Duke of Edinburgh, came in third with 144. The King was second with 197, and no surprise here. The Princess Royal topped the table with 212 official engagements. As well as the double cancer diagnosis suffered by the family this year, the Prince of Wales has also made clear that he will need more time to focus on helping his wife with her recovery. It comes after the previous departures of the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, who left to live in America, and the Duke of York, who stepped down from royal duties five years ago over his friendship with the convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. It not only means more engagements for the Duchess, but a more high-profile role on the world stage. She joined the Duke of Edinburgh when he twice flew out to Paris this summer, attending the Olympic Games and then returning for the Paralympic Games. In April, Sophie made a surprise trip to Ukraine, becoming the first member of the royal family to travel there since the Russian invasion began. During a visit on behalf of the Foreign Office to demonstrate solidarity with the women, men and children impacted by the war, she met President Zelensky in Kiev and went to the town of Bukha, the scene of a massacre by Russian forces. There have been several other royal firsts. For Sophie, in recent years, in May last year, she became the first member of the royal family to visit Baghdad in Iraq. There, she was formally received by President Rashid and returned his hospitality by hosting him at St. James's Palace last month. This year, the Duchess has visited Tanzania to continue her work to raise awareness of a preventable disease which can cause blindness, taking a message from the King. On October the 7th, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh will travel to Malta for a series of engagements. For the royal family, the country is known as the place where the Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip enjoyed life as young newlyweds. They stayed in Villa Guadamangia, which was owned by Philip's uncle, Lord Mountbatten, and they enjoyed more freedom there than they could in London. Accordingly, a brief article highlighting the increase in engagements by Duchess Sophie but it also demonstrates another point, as you can see from the pictures and from what you've heard, by way of a comparison with this one's wife. For instance, you will see that Sophie is always appropriately dressed, wearing smart dresses, blazers. You'll notice in one picture that she's wearing a respectful headscarf, that she isn't showing her shoulders, isn't showing off lots of skin, isn't showing off her thighs, isn't dressed in a way which might be deemed offensive, or at least is viewed as inappropriate for the circumstances. She isn't turning up at a school showing lots of flesh. She isn't showing off her shoulders and cleavage in a conservative country, unlike this one's wife. When she speaks, what she has to say is sincere. It isn't a word salad. There's no camera hugging. You won't find the Duchess of Edinburgh staring straight down the lens in the way that this one's wife does. You'll see that she deals with people courteously and respectfully. She isn't barging in front of Edward to muscle him out of the picture. She isn't wandering around with a rictus grin fixed on her face. She takes her role seriously, and it's little wonder that the late Queen favoured her so much. She is reliable, exhibiting emotional empathy, not making it all about her. And the contrast between her and this one's wife not only is stark, but it's worth making. This is another example of the way that an appropriate royal should behave. Now, you might argue, well, this one's wife isn't really a royal anymore. She's not a working royal. But then when she goes to places such as Nigeria and Colombia, she effectively behaves as if she were a royal. After all, she hasn't jettisoned the title. She still wants to be known as the Duchess of Sussex. She flounces around as if she were royalty, but she doesn't behave in the way that royalty would expect. You don't hear about the Duchess of Edinburgh banging on about lifestyle brands, going on about hot yoga, wanting to turn up at the Oscars. She's doing the actual spade work of going to animal sanctuaries, of going to Ukraine, of going to Iraq, of going to Tanzania. Yes, we know that this one's wife went to places such as Colombia and Nigeria, which ordinarily wouldn't be viewed as the most glamorous. But, first of all, she only went there because the opportunities to go to more glamorous places aren't there for her, nobody's offering, and she tried to turn it into a royal event. Note 
the, with the Duchess of Edinburgh, she's taking an actual interest in the topics, not just standing there grabbing a mic and banging on about herself. And this provides you with the contrast between somebody who has emotional empathy that acts with responsibility and accountability compared to the self-centred and self-absorbed behaviour of this one's wife. Whilst, of course, what the Duchess of Edinburgh will be reported on, and she's given an increasing promin increased prominence as a consequence of the increase of engagements that she's engaging in, it is done in a solid and reliable no-fuss manner. There's no drama. There's no accusations, for instance, of her being a bully or a demon boss. There isn't the scene stealing that takes place when this one's wife comes to town. It is a complete contrast between the two women. One who can be relied upon, who is there to demonstrate service. And the other who is simply there to service her own needs. Once again, Duchess Sophie slays this one's wife in showing how one should conduct oneself. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening. <laughs>